reminders and folks in memory. Uh, just on a side note, in, on page 19, you'll see an update to uh, our financial update for 2023. And with that, I just want to say two things. One is, praise the Lord. Right? We, we don't want to gloss over, do we? The reality of God's provision and care financially through the generosity of his people. So we want to simply say praise the Lord and grateful for his provision for us as a church. And second, uh, just uh, on the 11th of February, after a morning worship service, before our fellowship lunch, uh, we're going to schedule our stewardship report. Uh, and that'll give more details to that, but also we'll talk about how how God is enabling us to accomplish His mission and our vision together. And so that will be on the 11th uh, after our morning worship service before our fellowship lunch. Uh, something to look forward to. If you turn back to page one uh, in a minute, I'll pray for us, and then we'll stand for our call to worship. Uh, many of you, of you are aware, but I do want to make you aware uh, and ask for your prayers. Uh, our sister, uh, Pat Johnson, lost her husband, Bill, this week. So Bill went to, went to be with Jesus, and so we lament uh, his passing and yet rejoice that he is in the presence of the Lord. So we want to continue to pray for the Johnson family. With that, we'll pray for them, and then... Uh, and then I'll open us in prayer and then we'll stand for our call to worship. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you for the life of Bill Johnson. And we thank you that because he is in Christ, he is in your presence and fullness of joy. And we rejoice over that fact. And at the same time, now we pray for Pat and the kids as they uh, grieve the passing of, uh, of Bill. And probably pray that you would comfort them uh, and give them eyes to see the reality of his state in Christ. Father, now as your people, we come and we ask that through your word and through the work of your spirit, uh, Father, would you lead us to all truth when you engage us in the worship of your great name. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand for our call of worship if you are able. From Psalm 95, verses 6 through 7, I'll read the light print. Please respond in unison. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand.
come now to affirming our faith together. This morning, doing so from the New City Catechism, question three. I'll ask the question and ask that you respond in the bold with the affirmation, and then we will have a time of corporate confession of sin and then silent confession of sin. How many persons are there in God? We affirm the God in whom we believe, and we acknowledge at the same time that we have sinned against this powerful, glorious, and holy God, a God in three persons. Let's pray together our prayer of confession. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am the worst sinner I actually know, not anyone else but me. My sins are the worst sins I actually know anything about. My own hypocrisy, my own temper, my own fears, my own lusts, my own grudges, my own tongue. I am the worst sinner I actually know, and your Son is my only hope, my only answer, my only confidence before you. In Jesus' name. We praise you, Father, that knowing our hypocrisy and temper and fears and lusts and grudges and sinful tongue, nevertheless, you offer mercy and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, and we thank you that you have assured us of the pardon that we have in him, as we find here in Hebrews chapter 9, where you tell us that just as it, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing, Arise, My Soul, Arise.
seated. And please join me now for a time of prayer. We praise you this morning, Father, for the grace you've given us to receive your Son, Jesus Christ. Grace to believe in his name and in him to become children of God. Thank you for owning us as your children so that with confidence we can now draw nigh. Confident in knowing that it pleases you to hear our prayers as well as to give us what we ask for. Or if not what we ask for, then something greater than we've asked or could even think to ask. Thank you for each and every member of our church family. Thank you in particular for these we are praying for by name this morning. For our sister, Amanda McPhail, bless her walk with you, we pray. May she have faith like a child, and may it grow deeper and stronger this year. Bless her service to you in our women's ministry here at Emmanuel. Give her wisdom and joy in that work, and use it to help the other women here grow in their faith. Bless her daily work with Nueva Providencia in Colombia as well. Give her discernment and strength each day, both to know and to do what would please you in that role. And in her family relationships, we pray you would bless her as a daughter, a sister, and an aunt. May she honor and serve you in these relationships. And regarding any others you might have for her, we pray you would give her the desires of her heart. For Rick and Donna Medlin and their son Cam, we thank you for sustaining them through a difficult fall and for how you worked in the hearts of your people here to care for them and to minister to their needs, both in ongoing and in special ways. We ask this morning for their physical needs, that Donna's health would improve, and that Rick would have the strength to teach another semester at Stetson. We pray for Cam as well to find good rest and increasing physical strength. And for all of them, we pray that you would encourage their souls and so fill them with your spirit that others would see the light of Christ in them and be drawn to you. We pray also for Rick and Donna's daughter, Marissa, and her new husband, Adrian. As newlyweds, we pray you would grant them grace in these early days to put you at the center of their marriage and to keep you there. Individually and together, may your love be their model, their strength, their comfort, their hope, and their deepest joy and satisfaction, so that in this season and every season ahead, they may honor you and one another and experience your fullest blessing. And to that end, we pray more immediately that you would provide a church that they can attend together. For our neighbors, Father, we pray this morning for Coastal Choices Women's Clinic. And in this season where we remember in a special way the sanctity of human life, and especially the lives of unborn children, we thank you for this ministry. Thank you for using this ministry to promote life and justice for those who cannot advocate for it themselves, and for assisting their mothers and families to care for themselves and for one another. We pray you will bless Coastal Choices to carry on this work by faith in you and in accordance with your word. We pray that as needed, you will raise up volunteers to assist with the work and that through their efforts, you will show mercy to our neighbors here in Volusia County. We also join them in praying that you would work in us and in our fellow citizens to value life at every stage and that this would become reflected both in our laws, but especially in how we care for and love one another. And finally, we pray this morning for our student mentoring outreach at George Marks Elementary School. Thank you for those among us who organize and participate in this ministry of building relationships with children who need more caring and consistent adults in their lives. Bless those relationships among our mentors that are continuing from last year. May they deepen and grow, enriching both the lives of the students and of the mentors. And for those relationships that are new, 
Lord, may you grant them to make strong initial connections that lead to long-term enriching relationships. And in all of them, we pray that you would grant your people to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. And may it be for all the students as well as the teachers who observe the smell, may that smell be an aroma of life to life. Lord, in all these things, we thank you that you hear us and we believe that, you, that we will receive what we have asked for or better because we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we now sing, I will glory in my Redeemer. Our great God, because we glory in our Redeemer, because we have experienced the saving worth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us freedom that we would be able to return a portion of your blessing and gifts to us, to you through our tithes and offerings, so that the ministry of Christ church would go forth. Thank you for that privilege. Thank you for that opportunity. And bless these gifts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand for the doxology. Our sermon text this morning, as we begin our journey and study in the book of Acts, is Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 11. Let's give attention to the reading of God's inspired and holy and inerrant word to us. Acts 1, 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when He was taken up, after He had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom He had chosen. He presented Himself alive to them after His suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You heard from Me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, he will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Open my eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. And Father, we ask now that You would help us as we uh, look at this passage. Help us to understand Your Word. Give us a mind to understand these Scriptures so that we would understand more about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the wonders of His church. Your Word is a saving Word. And so, Father, we ask that Your grace would be present and enable one to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, the Savior of sinners this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, This past summer, uh, on one of my hikes, I had the opportunity to be in the Beartooth Mountains of Montana. It was a solo day hike and about eight miles up, uh, I came to uh, my destination. It was a glacier lake at about 10,000 feet, Uh, and as I came over the crest and down towards the lake, you can begin to see this glacier bowl lake, and it was pristine. Nobody was there, and unlike other days, there was no wind. It was still, and as I came down to the water's edge, all the water was completely still, and because there's still a little boy in me, what is the first thing that I did? I threw a rock. And as the rock splashed, about 20 yards out, it began to ripple and ripple and ripple. Because nothing was competing for it. You see, the ascension, the heavenly session of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Heavenly Father is often an overlooked doctrine. How often have you pondered the ascension and the present reign and rule of King Jesus? 
Yet as we will discover in our passage, the ascension of Jesus to the Father's right hand to reign and rule is a pivotal moment in redemptive history. The ascension changes everything. In many ways, it is the rock from which many ripples will flow. As we begin our study this morning in the book of Acts, by way of introduction, I thought we should just simply read the precursor to the book of Acts, the Gospel of Luke. But that probably would not be appropriate to start in Luke 1 through 24. We may not make it all the way through this morning. You see, that is because the book of Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and the book of the Acts of the Apostles are a cohesive work. And so that background is important for us to understand. They were both written by Luke. Church, church historians hold that Luke was that beloved physician that we see in Colossians 4, who occasionally participated with the Apostle Paul in his missionary endeavors. We see mention of that in Philemon and 2 Timothy. From the preface of Luke's gospel, it appears that Luke was a second generation Christian who was not personally involved in the ministry of Jesus, but who had contact with those who had been eyewitnesses and revealed these things to Luke. Although Luke did not participate in the ministry of Jesus during the gospel of Luke, he was occasionally present and a personal eyewitness in the book of Acts. And we'll see that in our study because there are many passages where Luke uses the word we, meaning I was present for these things. From his writings, commentators agree that Luke had a native uh, tongue. His native tongue was Hel uh, Hellenistic Greek. And it seems that he had progressed higher and higher in levels of education in the Greco-Roman World. Luke and Acts are one work as they are both written by Luke, but they are written for Theophilus and the church. Although we don't know much about Theophilus, it appears that he was a Christian of some importance and means. Luke addresses him as most excellent Theophilus in his prelude to the gospel. It's a term of honor and position in the Greco-Roman world. It is likely that Theophilus was the patron of Luke and financially sponsored Luke's journeys and traveled and the writing of this orderly account, an orderly account of the teaching and the work of Jesus. Luke and Acts are both historical narratives. They are carefully cultivated and dependent upon eyewitness testimony. One commentator states, Acts was described as a theological history in the sense that it records God's activity in filling His promises and working out His purposes for humanity. At the same time, it was maintained that Luke is a reliable historian who, has not, uh, who not only allowed his theology and apologetic agenda to distort the facts. You see, Luke and Acts are historically accurate and reliable but in addition, what they capture for us is God's divine story and divine inspiration in God's continuing work of redemption. Ultimately, what we see is that this is God's work and God's purposes being described in real time and in real space in the books of Luke and Acts. The books of Luke and Acts are written for the church. They are written to generate clarity. They are written to generate certainty over the ministry, over the works and the teachings of Jesus and His continued work through the ministry of the apostles and the church. The connectivity between these works is also noted how they start and end. Luke's gospel ends with the ascension of Jesus and the book of Acts begins with the ascension as we have heard in the reading of our sermon passage. Luke and Acts are connected, but they are different. As our passage reveals, the Gospel of Luke focuses on the works and the teaching of Jesus up to His ascension, and the book of Acts will capture the works and the teaching of Jesus as they are carried out by the witness of His people and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
Luke contains the witness from the beginning of the works and words of Jesus, and Acts contains the continuation of the works and words of Jesus. The book of Acts captures a significant transition in redemptive history that we will discover through our study. You see, that transition is from the physical, earthly presence of Jesus Christ to His reign and rule through His spiritual presence and the life of His followers who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts describes for us the beginning of the age of the Holy Spirit, an age that you and I are still a part of now. The book of Acts describes for us the transition in redemptive history from Uh, under God's covenant administrations of grace from the Old to New Covenant. The Old Covenant, like we hear in the preaching of John the Baptist, called mankind to repent of their sins and to prepare for the coming of God's promised Messiah. In the New Covenant, all of the promises and obligations of the Old Covenant are fulfilled in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. As John the Baptist proclaimed to Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the Old Covenant, salvation is applied by faith. Faith that looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. In the New Covenant, under that new administration, the New Covenant, salvation is applied by faith. Faith that looks back upon the works of Christ Jesus. The Messiah has come. Although salvation in the Old and New Covenant are applied by faith, faith now that looks back upon the works of Christ, the Messiah has come, but they are also dependent on Christ alone. In the New Covenant, God's people are marked by the coming and indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. You see, as such, God promises to the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 30. 133, which says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This promise is fulfilled. See, the book of Acts describes for us a significant transition in the kingdom of God. God's people, the people of His choosing, no longer will be comprised primarily of the descendants of Israel, but will expand and explode to include the Gentiles and worshipers from all the nations and all the peoples on earth. No longer will God's presence and the center of worship be dependent upon the center, or dependent upon and centered upon Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and the Holy of Holies, but the Church of Jesus Christ, and in the hearts of His people, will be the epicenter of His kingdom. In Christ's church, as God's people, as we gather to worship today in spirit and truth, we experience and we bear witness to God's presence, to God's reign, to God's rule among all the peoples of the earth. The kingdom of God will now uh, be expressed visibly through the church and not the nation of Israel. The promised remnant of God's elect from the tribes of Israel now find their hope and surety not in the restoration of the physical kingdom of Israel, but in the spiritual kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. The book of Acts describes for us this transition in the kingdom of God. The book of Acts describes for us the emergence of the church, Christ's church, how it was organized, how it was catechized, and its mission. The book of Acts describes for us the age of the apostles in which the gospel message was boldly proclaimed and it was validated by their miraculous work done through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts prepares us for the transition of gospel ministry being centered on the apostolic witness to the gospel ministry centered on the faithful witness of the church. Luke and Acts are divinely Uh, inspired and they divinely capture for us and for all time the faithful and reliable witness of the Lord Jesus Christ and His continuing work in us and through us through the apostles. Luke and Acts are one cohesive work. They describe for us significant transitions in in redemptive history and in gospel ministry 
the book of Acts bears witness to the emergence of the church of Jesus Christ. And I could go on and on, but I won't. But see, most of all, the book of Acts reveals to us the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes and His ongoing plans for the church and for each of us. God is the primary actor in His story of redemption. And as such, the book of Acts will lead us to exalt and glory in God. With this framework, let us begin to unpack our passage under our three headings this morning. Preparation, continuation, and exaltation. Look at verses 1 through 5 under preparation. Except for the Gospel of Mark... The Gospel writers record for us some of the events and encounters between the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and His disciples and followers. In chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel, He records for us the witness of Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, Peter, and others who witnessed the stone rolled away, the empty tomb, and the declaration of the angels to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Luke reveals to us that Jesus walked with some of His disciples on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, unrecognized initially, as Jesus explained, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that all the Scriptures were about Him. After the Emmaus encounter back in Jerusalem, Jesus reveals Himself to all His disciples, displaying His resurrected humanity to them and opening their minds to understand the Scriptures. Listen to Luke 24, 45 through 49. Then He opened, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You see, the Gospel of Luke ends with Jesus teaching His disciples and preparing them to be His spokesmen, His witnesses to the resurrection. And those who will rightly proclaim that repentance for the forgiveness of sins among the nations is found only in Christ Jesus. Here in our passage in verses 1-3, through Luke states that all Jesus began to do and teach is recorded in the first book, that's the Gospel of Luke, and will now be continued, not directly by Jesus, but by the apostles through the Holy Spirit. As we've seen in Luke's Gospel, here in the prelude to Acts, Luke summarizes 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension to have been filled with many proofs that Jesus was alive and His teaching of the disciples about the kingdom of God. Jesus is preparing the disciples for His departure. He's assured them of His resurrection. And He teaches them how to rightly understand the Scriptures in view of God's redemptive plan through His life, death, and resurrection. Not only are the apostles prepared through the physical interaction with Jesus and careful instruction, but they are to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Their apostolic witness will be empowered by the Holy Spirit The witness of the disciples, the gospel message, the good news about the kingdom of God will be effective only by the agency of the Holy Spirit as we will see in the weeks to come. The Spirit-empowered ministry of Jesus that we read about and He fulfills in Isaiah 61 will now be fulfilled by the Spirit indwelling of the disciples and those who by repentance and faith respond to the proclamation of of the gospel. If you are in Christ, that is each of us this morning. And yet we gloss over these truths and don't grasp their magnitude, do we? If you remember in John chapter 16, Jesus taught His disciples that He would go away after He'd accomplished the plan of redemption. He would ascend to His heavenly Father and reign and rule and It was a place that the disciples could not yet come. 
In advance, Jesus taught His disciples that His departure and ascension were to be to their advantage because he did, if He did not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, would not come. Hear the words of Jesus in John 16, 13 through 15. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has, my, has is Mine. Therefore I said, He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. You see, as Jesus has been preparing His disciples for His post-resurrection departure, He's confident not in the wisdom, not in the power, and not in the character of these disciples, but in the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in them and through them. In fact, if you see in verse 6, the disciples still don't understand the kingdom of God, even though for the past 40 days Jesus has been talking to them about it. They don't understand that it's not geographic or ethnic. But after His ascension, after they're empowered by the Spirit, these same apostles will turn the world upside down. Look at verses 6 through 8 under the heading, Continuation. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is preparing His disciples for His continuing work. Right? In response to their questions about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel in verse 6, Jesus rebukes them and charges them with a much greater task. Jesus reminds them of God's sovereignty. The timing and the fulfillment of God's plans of redemption belong to God alone. They are His divine prerogative. And as such, they will come to pass. And they are not for the disciples to know. But what is for the disciples after the coming of the Spirit Holy Spirit is the mission, the Great Commission. The wit they are to be witnesses for Jesus. They are to bear witness about the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and future return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are to bear witness about God's plan of redemption and how it's been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. They are be to be witnesses that salvation can be found only one in one name alone, under the name of Jesus, by faith alone. They are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The gospel message, God's plan of redemption, the glory of King Jesus, the kingdom of God is not contained by geography or ethnicity, but through the work of the Holy Spirit, the disciples and future followers of Jesus Christ will be witnesses of the kingdom of God into all of the earth and all peoples. Jesus is charging His disciples with a greater mission. The nation of Israel is not enough. God's redemptive plans and purposes have always been greater. Consider for a moment the implications of preparation and continuation. If you are in Christ, then you this morning are a beneficiary of the faithful gospel witness of the apostles and the continuation of the witness of God's people in Christ's church in all ages. You see, as Jesus is preparing His disciples for His earthly departure and the coming of the Holy Spirit, He does so with each of us this morning in mind. God's plan to gather His children from every tribe, language, and people into the church of His beloved Son is not possible to be accomplished with the earthly limitations of the physical presence of Christ Jesus, He must depart. God's plan of redemption will be accomplished through Christ's spiritual presence, His reign and rule, and the power of the Holy Spirit enabling the faithful witness of His people. Through the faithful witness of His people, the glory of God and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ will go forth from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth as we will see in the book of Acts. But if you are in Christ, then you bear witness to this truth. We are the beneficiaries this morning 
of the continuing ministry of Jesus. His words, His works being shared with us through the witness of His people. Not only are we beneficiaries, but we are to be benefactors. Like Theophilus, we are to be patrons of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like Luke, we're to be those who bring clarity through our grasp and understanding of the Scriptures that we declare to others. In short, we are to be witnesses for Jesus. His ministry continues through each of us. This should do two things. It should humble us and it should challenge us. Yet as with the disciples who were broken vessels, God through the work of the Spirit works in them and through them. In this same way, God will work in us and through us to be witnesses to the nations of God's glory, of God's grace, and God's goodness found in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We are prepared and we are to continue this ministry as Christ laid out for His disciples. Look at verses 9 through 11 under exaltation. Luke recounts the ascension of Jesus like the transfiguration that revealed to some of the disciples the glory of His divine nature. Luke describes ascension uh, in, in God-exalting and God-glorifying language. As the disciples look up, Jesus is lifted up. This is much more than physical space as all the heavens and the entire cosmos were created by Jesus, and He's not contained in a particular space. This is referring to His exaltation above all things. Jesus is lifted up. King Jesus is lifted up. He ascends in triumph to His Father's right hand, from where He is reigning and ruling over the kingdom of God even now. Jesus is reigning and ruling over all the earth. He is making all things new. He is keeping His promise to build His church. Think of that. Despite our weaknesses, despite our failures, despite the opposition of sin, Jesus is building His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because He has ascended and is ruling over all. King Jesus is the head of His church. He is speaking now. He is working salvation for us now. His work of redemption, renewal, and restoration are ongoing now. The work of Jesus is growing now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and through the witness of His people in His church. As the disciples witness the ascension, they are caught navel-gazing, are they not, by the angels. They are reminded by the angels of what they need to do, and they are given the promise that Jesus will one day return in all glory and the fullness of time. Jesus had directed disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Luke records in the, in the Gospel of Luke that after the ascension, after the admonition and promise given by the angels, the disciples do gather and wait in Jerusalem and they worship. Listen to Luke chapter 24, verses 51 through 53. While Jesus blessed them, He parted from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped Him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. You see, the right response of faith to the ascension and the heavenly session of Jesus is only that. It's worship. It's awe. It's bowing our knee to His rule and His authority and His lordship. Like the disciples, we're called to be ready, to get ready, to be prepared. Like the disciples, we're called to get to work, continuation, to be faithful witnesses. Like the disciples, we're called to anticipate, that is present and future. To anticipate, to exalt in the present reign and rule of Jesus and to anticipate a future when He will return and all things will be made new. 
You see, when we begin to see the ascended and exalted Jesus, when we will exalt and exclaim with the apostles and the faithful witness of God's people, the wonder and the excellencies of the gospel of Jesus Christ and their transforming power and grace in our lives. You see, what Acts 1-11 through declares to us this morning is that Jesus has come. Jesus has risen from the dead and conquered sin and death. Jesus has ascended on high and is reigning and ruling now. And Jesus will come again. You see, that is the hope of His people and the hope of His church. And we are to respond. We are to Respond with preparation, continuation, and exaltation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We do pray now that your word would find good soil, that your word would accomplish its purpose for which you sent it. And so, Father, where we need to be reminded of those who have come before us as faithful witnesses, And we need to praise you for them. Would you help us to do so? Where we need to be reminded that we are called to be your witnesses and continuing this gospel work, the gospel work of King Jesus himself. Would you help us to realize the immensity and the honor and the privilege of that task and the reality that you've enabled us to do so by the work and the power of your spirit? Father, would you cause cause us to see if we have not seen before? the reality that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And if we have not rested in Him, would you help us to do so by repentance and faith? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just one bit of instruction before we sing our next song. We will only sing the refrain after verses 2, 4, and 5. So let's stand and sing together, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed.
morning is that I have thrown a ripple into your life through thinking and pondering about the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about Jesus and His plan of salvation for us, I'd love to have that conversation with you as well as try to answer any other questions that you would have. We would, I'll be in the breezeway. would love to start that conversation or schedule that conversation. But also, because we are witnesses to these realities and truths that have been kept for us by reliable witnesses, we need to bear witness to one another, my friends, of the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us do that. Receive now the benediction. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.